To a topologist, a mug is the same as a donut because there's a continuous mapping from the mug to the donut, and there's an inverse continuous mapping that does the reverse. The word same means that they share all topological properties. For example, they're both connected, they're both compact, and they both have a non-trivial loop, one that cannot be shrunk to a point. If we peek into their topological structures, we will observe that their underlying sets are in bijections, and their open sets, which define their topologies, are also in bijection in accordance. It is as if we are just renaming the points. So in some sense, they are the same at a more fundamental level, without even mentioning continuous mapping or topology. Here is a more minimal example, concerning sets with binary operations. On the left-hand side, we have the set 0, 1, 2, equivalence addition, but we always subtract 3 when we are at over 3. On the right-hand side, we have the set ABC with a specific multiplication table. Again, we don't need to know about groups or group homomorphisms to see that they're the same. The only difference is in how we name the elements and the operations. So, can we capture this general idea that two things can be the same up to renaming? The answer is yes, and this is what the univalence axiom accomplishes. To understand and appreciate the univalence axiom, we need some background knowledge about type theory as a foundation of math. Set theory is built by extending a system of logic with axioms, some telling us how to form sets, and some optional ones that enable us to prove more theorems. In contrast, type theory unites logics, sets, and more under primitive types. Primitive types already provide a rich computational theory where we can do plenty of math, and axioms are completely optional. Here are some of the primitive types. We have the function types, whose elements are functions, pair types, whose elements are pairs of elements, sum types, which is like a disjoint union, the zero type with no elements, the one type with a single element, the natural number type, and the identity types, which for the time being we may think of as the one type when the two sides are the same, and the zero type otherwise. All primitive types here besides the function types are governed by induction. Yes, it's the exact same principle that governs the natural numbers. And to prepare us for the identity type and to get taste of type theory, let's see how the natural number type works. The natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on are elements of the natural number type. Formally, we say that its constructors are the element 0 and the element n plus 1 for every element n. Be aware that the constructor plus 1 should be seen as a whole. We have a defined addition, and 1 is defined to be 0 plus 1, and not the other way around. Induction tells us how to define a function from the natural number type n to a type a. It says that we just need to define f0, and then for each n, define f of n plus 1 as something that may depend on f of n. The idea is that the second rule gives us the definition of f1 using f0, and then the definition of f2 using f1, and then f3, and so on, like a row of dominoes. We will write triple lines to denote equality by definition to distinguish it from the identity type. To define addition operation using induction, we can say for every natural number n, we are going to define the addition of n and 0 to be just n, and then for every m, the addition of n and m plus 1 to be the addition of n and m, and then plus 1. We will write n plus m for the addition of n and m. It should not yield any confusion with the constructor plus 1, because the addition of n and 1 is definitionally the same as n plus 1. We can also prove theorems using induction. Proving a theorem in type theory involves expressing the theorem as a type, and then supplying an element of that type. That element is what we call a proof. For example, commutativity of addition says that n plus m equals n plus n for all n and m. We express it as a function type whose elements takes two natural numbers, n and m, and spit out an element of the type n plus m equals n plus n. Recall that this is the identity type. And note that n plus m equals n plus n is a different type for each pair of n and m. It is perfectly fine to have the type of output of a function to be dependent on the input, and we call such a function a dependent function. For simplicity, we will only prove a special case when n is 0. Two things to note. 
First, the induction principle has a dependent version. It follows the exact same pattern, we just add the dependency of the output type on the input. Second, with our definition of addition, m plus 0 is definitionally just m, but 0 plus m only reduces when m is either 0 or some number plus 1. For general m, 0 plus m simply does not reduce. By induction, we need to first prove 0 plus 0 equals 0. The left-hand side is definitionally 0, so we just need to prove 0 equals 0. This can be proven by reflexivity, which is the constructor for the identity type when the two sides are the same. As an expression, we can write it as refo sub 0, but it's also valid and more flexible to use words. Next, we need to prove 0 plus m plus 1 equals m plus 1. We can move the parentheses using the definition of addition. The definition of f of m plus 1 can depend on f of m, which is an element of 0 plus m equals m. And we can just apply plus 1 to both sides to finish the proof. When I say plus 1 to both sides, I'm really citing a theorem that says if n equals m, then m plus 1 equals m plus 1, which is really a function. If you call this function apply sub plus 1, then we can define f of m plus 1 using this expression instead of words. In general, induction in type theory is the idea that to define a function, it suffices to define it on the constructors. Let's apply this idea to the identity type. The identity type is formed by writing an equal sign between two elements of the same type. It has a constructor, ref of x, of type x equals x for every x. The induction rule says that to define a function that takes x, y in an element p of type x equals y, it suffices to define it on x, x, and ref of x for an arbitrary x. Using induction, we can define the apply plus 1 function simply by defining it to be ref of n plus 1 on n n ref of n. Note that the third argument of f and apply plus 1 can be used to infer the first two arguments, so we can omit them when the element of the identity type is provided. As a side, we can also prove symmetry and transitivity of identity type by induction. These are convincing evidence that the identity type does behave like the traditional equality. Now, zoom out and take a look at this iconic result of univalence. Since identity type requires the two sides to be elements, and A and B here represent types, we want a type of types to support the formation of A equals B. However, we cannot have a type of all types, since that will run into paradoxes similar to Russell's paradox for a set of all sets. But we can have a type that contains a large family of types, which includes all previous mentioned type formers. We call it the universe and denote it by u. It is a type, and for every element a and u, we have the type t of a. t is a type family over u, just like how n plus m equals m plus n is a type family over the pair type n times n. By the way, the concept of a universe is also not unique to type theory. Even in set theory, we need universes to make category theory nicer. And one more comment about the universe, the conversion from elements of u to types using t is usually made implicit. For example, the equivalence type should still be formed between two types, so technically we should write t of a and t of b, but we can omit the t's to get back to this iconic expression. Using universe and identity type, we can capture what it means for two equal things to share all possible properties. Consider the collection of all types in u as a binary operation. Call the type bind for binary. A property about elements of bind is represented by a type family or bind. For example, commutativity can be expressed as so. If two elements of bind are equal, we expect that if one is commutative, then so is the other. We can indeed define a function called transport that takes a proof of x equals y and returns a proof for that if x is commutative, then y is commutative. Simply define it to be the identity function on REFL, and we are done. After all, the only constructor for x equals y is when x and y are definitionally the same. Moreover, observe that we can define transport for any type family B over any type A. That's to say, we can transport any property along equalities of any structure. The transport function would have been much more useful if equivalent types are equal. Then we can truly transport properties or even structures on the mug to those on the donut. What's holding it back is that 
only elements of the identity types are RUFL, and in which case, transport does nothing more than the identity function. The power of the univalence axiom exactly comes from the fact that it introduces additional elements of the identity type, allowing equivalent things to be equal, realizing the potential of the transport function. For a new picture of the identity type that allows for more elements, we can imagine types as spaces, elements as points, and elements in the identity type A equals B as paths from A to B. This picture is quite nice because reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity can all be represented geometrically as the stationary path, path reversal, and path concatenation, respectively. In assuming univalence, we can draw two paths from the set 0, 1 to the set A, B because there are two bijections between them. However, having additional elements in the identity type is not without issues. Consider the equivalence type. A proof of A being equivalent to B should consist of a function f from A to B and a proof that f is equivalent. The obvious definition that f is equivalent is when there is an inverse function. But this is actually not a good one. This is because now it's possible for the identity type between functions to have more than one element as well, and its equivalent of f as a result can have more than one element. This is undesirable because we want two equivalences from A to B to be the same as long as the underlying functions are equal. Otherwise, there could be more equivalences from A to B than their functions. The property that we want is equivalent to satisfy is that it is a proposition. A type is a proposition when any two elements are equal. Basically, once we know whether there is a proof, that's all there is to the type. Some examples include the zero type representing false, the one type representing true, and is prop of A itself is a proposition for all type A. This applies to all types that we prefix is with. Propositions belong to a whole hierarchy of types, the next level being sets, which are discrete spaces, characterized by identity types between elements, are propositions. Examples include our propositions, the natural number type, the set of integers, the set of real numbers. Do be careful to distinguish paths as in elements of the identity type from paths on a topological space. One is not equal to pi as real numbers. Despite there's a path in the topological sense connecting them, there is no such path in the sense of identity type. Next level is where it gets exciting. We have one types whose identity types between elements are sets. For example, this circle type is a one type and not a set because the elements of x equals x or paths from x to x are characterized by their winding numbers. This is to say how many times a path goes around in one direction and we count negatively if the path goes in the other direction. So x equals x is equivalent to the set of integers. Under univalence, the type of all sets in U is a one type, because paths between them are bijections, and types of all bijections between two sets is a set. We can keep going to two types. An example is the sphere type, because the space of paths from the north pole to the south pole, for example, is equivalent to a circle. And this hierarchy continues forever. We can study homotopy theory, which is a theory of paths on spaces and paths between paths using types rather than topological spaces. This area of research is called homotopy type theory, hot for short, and hence the pun in the title of the video. As a side note, the type theory presented here is a subset of the what's so-called book hot, referring to the canonical book on the subject, Homotopy Type Theory, Univalent Foundations of Mathematics. Let's get back on track and give a good definition of equivalence. In words, we say if a function from a to b is equivalent if for every b there exists a unique a, such that f of a is equal to b. This consists of three pieces of data for every b, an element a, a path from f of a to b, and for every x such that f of x is equal to b, we have a equals x. The resulting dependent function type that we wrote down is the definition of is equivalent of f. This definition is good because it is a proposition, which comes from the general fact that there exists a unique something statement always correspond to proposition. It is easy to prove that for every type A, the identity type is equivalence, and the transport function along arbitrary path is also equivalence. Why? Because if the path is raffle, transport is the identity function. 
And we have shown that identity functions are equivalences. And that's it. This is applying our friend induction. All right. We have finally collected all the pieces needed to give the precise statement of the univalence axia. It asserts that for every equivalence f, e of types in U, where f is the underlying function and e is the proof that f is an equivalence, there exists a unique path such that the transport function along that path with the proof that transport's equivalence is equal to f, e. We can package the data that transports equivalence into the function id to equiv. Then the univalence axiom simply states that id to equiv is an equivalence. It fits right here, proving the iconic result that a equals b is equivalent to a is equivalent to b. I want to end the video with a discussion on the slogan that mathematical objects are completely determined by their relationships with other objects. This statement is only half true without univalence. Relationships with other objects only determines an object up to equivalence, and univalence is needed to go from equivalence to equality. This, I think, is the profound reason why we should embrace the univalence axiom.